All right. Um, that brings us to the public comment portion of our meeting this evening. Um, please make sure that you've signed in with your name and address at the back of the room before you come forward to our podium. Public comment is limited to three minutes per person, which will count down on the timer that's up there on the wall. If your comment does pertain to an action item um, that appears later on in the agenda, we would ask that you please wait until that item comes up for discussion to make your comment. You will be allowed time to comment after the board discusses the item, but prior to the board taking a vote. Comments that are related to disciplinary actions or other matters which could be the subject of a grievance process or a matter to be heard or appealed to the board or comments that are derogatory of a person, business, or organization will be ruled to be out of order. Um, there are public comment forms at the back of the uh, room at the, well, at the back of the room at the back table. Um, you can fill those out um, if you would like and put them in the blue box instead of or in lieu of coming forwards. If you would like to make a public comment at the podium at this time, please come on forward. State your name and address prior to beginning your statement. Hi, I'm Michelle Roboto. I'm just, I'm going to be very short, but um, I just wanted to give you a quick update on the um, Chuck Basie filed, um, uh, pre-filed House Bill 1540 that would allow for recordings of IEP and 504 meetings. Um, but one thing I did want to point out, because one thing that we've heard in, in speaking with the different educators and different education groups was the retaliation wording. So that, that um, what was pre-filed has wording about retaliation protection for educators. So I wanted to, to put that on the record and make, let people know that. And also, since I still have a lot of extra time, I wanted to um, just praise you guys on the nature school because I went to the meeting to look at the plans and it was very cool. So I'm very excited about that. I think that's a great idea. Um, I know my kids loved it when we've done other type of nature things. So kudos to you guys. Um, I definitely feel like um, it's a great opportunity for our kids, for the community. I also think it's a great example of CPS being a trailblazer and a leader and uh, not being concerned about being one of the first. And I really appreciate that. Thanks. Good evening, Robin Shell. Last week, the government relations manager for MSTA asked me a question, and it's one that I get asked often. In fact, probably some of you have asked me that, and that is, why do you need a recording? Yeah, we're talking about the recording again. Um, if you get the paper IEP. I thought a fun analogy would be perfect for clarifying this question, because who doesn't like an analogy? So this is Cliff Notes for Pride and Prejudice. Pride and Prejudice. And in case Cliff Notes were not from your generation, Cliff Notes summarize the novel. This states the author's literary goals, as well as the literary techniques or benchmarks that she used to accomplish her goals. It outlines the characters, the setting, and the other main details. It's an overview of the book. I have two memories from my junior year AP Lit class. The first memory is discovering a love for all things Jane Austen. The other memory was the one time I decided to skip a reading assignment and read only the cliff notes. The book was The Grapes of Wrath. It didn't take more than a few minutes into the test to realize that while the cliff notes contained a lot of good information and the main elements of the novel, the novel had far more information and details not stated in the cliff notes. It was not my best test. I know you can see where I'm going with this. The two hour IEP meeting is the novel. The actual IEP document, Here's an example. It's the cliff notes of the meeting. Yes, the goals and the benchmarks are here, but the discussion about all the little steps and activities the teacher might do to meet the benchmarks is only found in the conversation of the meeting. Yes, the parent shares concerns and observations that are recorded in the IEP, but many more are shared throughout the meeting. Have a rec having a recording of the meeting allows the parents and the teachers to access all the details of the IEP meeting, not just what was determined and written on the few pages of the IEP. I can't see how recording an IEP meeting would be detrimental to a student, but I can see a lot of ways a student would benefit. Why wouldn't we want our students, parents, and teachers to have access to all the details from an important meeting? Parents have been asking to openly record since last March. It's time for an answer. I would ask that you set a timeline for a vote. Ask the task force for its report by February. In March, vote to either lift the prohibition of recording effective August 2020 
or vote to keep current policy in place, but make a decision. If you do vote to allow recording starting in August, then the district would have a couple months to, to put re the recommendations set forth by the task force into place. Please set a timeline for these decisions. And just a reminder that CPS should already have a policy or procedure for how recording will be handled for students and parents okay. with disabilities. That needs to be in place now, if not earlier. This falls under federal law. It would be great if the board would get ahead of any OCR complaints and get a policy or procedure in place. Thanks. Hi, I'm Laura Wakefield. And I'm here to talk about the annual survey. I know that Dr. Stupelman will be discussing that later. But I wanted to quickly discuss a couple of things about that as I've been reviewing it and really thinking about it and trying to enter into this inclusive mindset and really what is the purpose of that survey. I started thinking about how it makes many assumptions. This tool contains inherent biases that will attain the opinions of certain people usually people who have the privilege of literacy skills, financial means to have internet or transportation to go to the library or somewhere that has free internet, and the free time to spend answering a survey. So, of course, the sampling is biased like many surveys. Next, the tool has questions that guide people to answer uh, certain things in a certain way. So now your questions are biased. Next, you have someone code, categorize, and analyze that data. Um, and this person, I assume, works for CPS, or maybe they are an independent person, an independent consultant who gets paid by CPS, so now you have money entering the, the picture to influence that, right? Um, so either way, you know, you've got um, biases for that. And then the results are somewhat then predetermined when you think about it. It's really shaped already to be, give you the answers that you already want, and it's gonna tell you what you already want. So that, that's kind of something I've been thinking about when I looked at it. It seems like a shallow tool, and it seems like you would want to get deeper dives into really what's going on. And I would really like the board to consider in the future looking at something like an equity audit instead to really get to the answers that you really need. Thank you. Julie Olmstead. Uh, my daughter is a student at Rockbridge High School. Um, looking forward to the end of her senior year. Um, and as um, we are looking ahead to um, more funding, I know there's a bond issue, that sort of thing coming up. Um, I would ask the board to consider a funding for other uh, more uh, basic primary things um, as well, um, including uh, ADA compliance, um, continued education for specialist staff to um, kind of keep up with the current specialized technology and teaching methods for those especially with disabilities, um, as we have had some experience in that area um, being problematic um, for um, if your uh, specialist education is not up to par and um, not meeting the students' needs, um, let's please look at contracting out to those who do have the necessary <coughs> skills and are competent in um, teaching those skills to students um, who are in need. Um, let's also look at procuring digital platforms that are born in inclusion instead of a quick fix to try to um, make it appear that they're somewhat inclusive or accessible to those with disabilities. Um, and really just, uh, can we just kind of take care of some basic ADA compliance issues across the board um, instead of doing um, extra things at schools, um, basic students are really looking for basic needs to be met um, rather than recreational. Um, things available to them so thank you
Committee with Chad McLaren. Um, I'm going to be talking from the perspective of a member of Race Matters Friends. I know we've uh, had almost a year's worth of conversations going now. Uh, what I wanted to address tonight is basically taking a look at some of the uh, out-of-school suspensions and disciplinary approaches that CPS as a whole undertakes. Um, the chart that I'm passing around right now is showing as the school has demonstrated on their website or as they post on their website um, all of the out-of-school suspensions. All right, the three basic areas we're looking at are those on free and reduced lunches, um, black children, and all. Okay, these are the categories. There's some alarming discrepancies in this just by the way that it's set up that I want to make sure, we talked about it before, but I want to go on record so that everybody's aware of where our concerns really are derived from. Um, if you look at the OSS all, the benchmark for the number of suspensions in a given year, the target is 600. Yes. Okay, that's the number on the far left. Um, if you go to the CPS K-12 org website, go to the dashboard, it will show all the same um, information I have extracted right here. Um, when you look at the out-of-school suspensions for the black community, that is 150 is the target goal. That is one quarter of all suspensions. That's 25%, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I do not believe the black community makes up 25% of our population. It does. It does. Mm -hmm. What's the actual? Because I, I, I had no, I had a 20, problem finding that information. 23%. 23%? Okay. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be, no, you no, asked no, for a point of uh, clarification. So. I appreciate that you do. I would go so far as to say I would like to see that information more readily available on the website so that we're not having to kind of guess at these. But, okay, so, so that's, that's, that brings some ease in. If you look at the years, um, I know Dr. Stephen came on board 2014, 2015, so we can see, um, you know, there have been a reduction in the number of overall out-of-school suspensions. But if you look at the OSS disparity rate, it's, it's a very strange thing for data to follow that tight of a trend. For everything to be either 49 or 54 percent of the black community being responsible for the out-of-school suspensions, which is still double the rate of a white child, that, that's problematic. And the fact that it follows this tight of a trend throughout the next seven years is, is, is very highly suspicious. I would look at any data that came that tight and be like, are we actually reporting the right data? Is it, you know, is it just, is it a policy? Is there something systemic that we're looking at that would contribute to this type of um, formation and data? So um, we're just starting to scratch the surface, and I, I know I, I've been kind of out of the loop for the last couple of months, but I want to reiterate some of the um, things that we requested from the board and have you guys weigh in on this, and I'm going to go over just a little bit, but I'll summarize real quick. We are looking for a restorative justice framework. We want to, be, want to have that research base. We want it to be focused on these children that are being affected. We are looking for an equity audit to determine uh, these objectives so that we can implement reasonable standards that the school can implement and meet the needs of the community. Uh, for all schools, we want qualitative and quantitative school climate surveys, and again, these need to be vetted so that they're not inheriting or introducing bias into the equation. And also, we want a culturally responsive leadership that is prepared to model the behavior for those principals and classroom teachers. That we need to give them the resources that they can actually take care of a lot of these discrepancies in the classrooms right. or within the school district. Thank you. Thanks. Thank I you appreciate very much. It. No, no, I'm interested in that. Shawan Daniels. Um, me and this mom is here. We just asking and pleading that you guys uh, look into core things that's going on in the core. Uh, there's a lot of kids been injured there, and we just asking that the board look into that. And our kids have been victims, so that's why we're pleading and asking that you guys go out there and make sure that these people are properly certified to restrain these kids and things are being done accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. My name is LaQuisha Jackson of Child at Columbia Public Schools, and I am asking that you guys overlook things that's going on in CORE, as is um, probably get some type of um, evaluations with some of the staffs and see if there's some type of way that you guys can accommodate and help them with more staff to come in and help them. 
I believe some of the stress that comes toward, from these teachers that goes towards the children is because they are not have they do not have enough help, and because of that, our children are su is suffering because of the teachers are suffering from whatever personal problems, overworked or whatever. So we're just asking that you guys look into CORE and other schools so these teachers are getting the, the needs that they need to be able to teach our children so that can be some type of positive all around. Right now, it's, it's, it's not a positive look. It's not a positive look for us parents. When we're talking to some of these teachers, we're not being respected. We're not being um, heard. And some of them are, are unable to hear and understand us due to the fact that they have personal problems to where they they can't be there for us because mentally and mentally physically whatever's going on in their life they bringing it to work and is there some way you guys can stop them from bringing their negativity to work and be able to be there for the children like they were hired to be thank you i am marshall smith And I am speaking on behalf of um, the, uh, what they are uh, speaking in regards to the core program. Now, um, I've been in the Kansas City Public School Districts for the last 10 years. Never in my life have I heard anything like what I heard. I was devastated. I went to a meeting with uh, one of the persons whose child is in uh, one of these schools that put children in wooden boxes, just in case anyone else is not aware of what they are addressing. These kids are not disciplined in the office, sitting in ISS, but they are put in a box, a wooden box. I don't know if anyone in here would approve of their children being in a box, screaming and hollering. You know, people are in there with them. You don't know what these adults are doing to these children inside of these boxes or anything. Why are they coming up injured? Why is this child injured? Why is he screaming inside of a box with an adult? Why is he in the box in the first place? I think that is something that is totally inhumane because these children are not animals. When I first heard this, I was infuriated. And I feel like as a child, being in a wooden box, that's trauma. And this is something that's gonna carry them on. And, and what these teachers are lacking, and I'm not gonna say lacking, but it is a lot of people are trying to, um, I notice this because I see it myself. I, I walk into a classroom, and if it's a predominantly black classroom, then you have the teacher using slang or ebonics. That's not how you get to work with a child. That's not how, you have to be an adult before you try to be a, a child's friend. That's just like in parenting. And so then also another thing is that they, that their patience is thin because they know as soon, the first thing they look at is the policy. If you're here to teach and you truly care, it's about education, I'm a nurse a graduate practical nurse, so I deal with people myself. And But I love and I have a passion in what I do. And I can't go into a room and say, oh, you're complaining about pain, you're not hurt, and leave out, because pain is what the patient says. So, and with these children, if they're telling you that they need help, or if you're a teacher, you're supposed to be able to diagnose what their problem is. Maybe they're not, their curriculum is, you know, they're bored. Maybe they need more curriculum, or maybe you need to actually take the time out to individualize what you can with these children to structure their education so that they're not sitting in these wooden boxes or having to go to alternative schools. And they definitely need to uh, remedy the, uh, the core program, whatever it is, because it is totally inhumane. That's all I have to say, and thank you. Any further public comment for this section? <clears throat> All right, seeing none, that will conclude um, the public comment section of our meeting this evening.